Welcome viewers to Focus here at Channel 17, here in Burlington, Vermont, the Center for Media and Democracy. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and the topic for this program is the Dorothy Canfield Fisher name should be removed from the Vermont Book Awards. And on my far right is our guest, Judy Dow, who is an Abenaki educator, an artist, an activist, and a, uh, a Franco-American. Welcome, Judy. Thank, thank you. And, and viewers, thank you for, uh, for coming today. And on, on my second right is Kim Chase, who is an, a writer and activist and educator here in Vermont. Welcome, Kim. Thank you so much for coming. Franco-American bilingual. <laughs> Franco-American bilingual. Yes, thank you so much, Kim. And here to my immediate right is Kathy Olwell, who is a retired social worker and an activist who has worked extensively right here in the city of Burlington. So to begin with, thank oh, thank you so much for being here oh, and I'm welcome. <laughs> and uh, viewers, let's, let's hang on to our hats because we have a lot to learn from these women today. And the, the issue is the, uh, li the Library Book Awards, which are, have been called the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Book Awards for about 60 years. And what we are going to talk about is, is Dorothy Canfield Fisher, Fisher's link to the eugenics survey here in Vermont, which is going up to its 100th anniversary in, 19, in uh, 2021. So, Judy, could you start us off? You're going to present a PowerPoint, right? Yes. And could you put us right in into the action now? What is happening with the award name? Well, on April 7th, 2018, um, after many years of seeing the Dorothy Canfield Fisher um, Book Award it posted in many libraries and on the media, I decided to um, educate people on the State Library Board as to the, the pain, the, the, um, the uncomfortableness that some people with Franco-American and Native American descent experience when they see that book award. So I put together this PowerPoint um, that we're gonna see today and um, presented it to the board with Kim and Kathy's help um, because she has written numerous books. So in order to do that, we had to read most of her books. And so Kathy and Kim helped me to read everything. And um, so we put together the PowerPoint and we presented and it was received in total shock. Um, people were totally surprised um, with the information we had presented, and I believe they found it overwhelming. Um, so we left, um, and there was a meeting presented on July 11th, uh, 2018, at a library board meeting once again, and they had done some research, and several people had asked to be on the board to present their research. And their research was solely on Dorothy Campbell Fisher and how she had these amazing and wonderful accomplishments in her life, um, but had never direct, they had never directly connected her with eugenics and didn't even know about it. I just want to say, it was um, 2017, July 2017. Correct, May. yeah, correct, thank you. And, um, and so we went from that to the January 9th meeting in 2018, and the library board recommended to the state librarian, Scott Murphy, that um, he not, uh, that they, that he not continue with the Dorothy Campbell Fisher name, that they choose a different name. Um, so it, right now, it stands that Scott Murphy, the state librarian, still has to, um, make a comment as to whether the name will change or not. Is he the sole decider then? He is. Okay. But he asked at the April 7th meeting um, that he have a recommendation from the board and from the Dorothy Campbell Fisher Committee. Um, during that process of getting recommendation from various people, 
the Vermont State Library Association wrote a letter of recommendation asking the name also be changed. So it looks like you're going to get what you want, which is the removal of the name. Well, that would be nice. Um, I'm a little hesitant to state that until it actually happens, right? Right. Well, most of us are in the dark about this history in Vermont, the eugenics movement, and Dorothy Canfield Fisher, Fisher's involvement in it. So could you begin your PowerPoint and, uh, and show that to us, bring us some light on it? Sure. Um, first, I'd like to point out these books. Um, we read many of her books. We, um, we have just a few of her books here. The rest we got at um, libraries throughout the state, so they're still on library shelves. We also used various reference books and um, and so a lot of the PowerPoint comes from the reference books that we used. So the first one we used was um, Nancy Gallagher, who published, I think in 99, a book called Breeding Better Vermonters. And um, she defines eugenics. So we'll start with that on the first slide. Vermont Eugenics Survey investigations of Vermont families were inspired by the research models of the period. Their publications dramatized their efforts to install a eugenics consciousness among Vermonters. The survey's projects reflected, reflect the shifting beliefs of biologists, sociologists, and psychologists about hereditary and social causes of human problems during the interwar years. While preserving an under, underlying commitment to manage Vermont's underclass, through a comprehensive program of social planning, education, and reproductive control. And my, I started with this because my concerns were either people didn't know about the Vermont Eugenics Survey, they didn't understand it, or they just simply forgot about it. And, it, and that became clear to us at our first meeting on April 7th. So in our first meeting, when we started to present this information, they told us that they had gone to the previous board and the mentors that they had, the Dorothy Campbell Fisher Committee had, and they all said, yeah, we knew that, but they made no change. Um, the next slide is just a, a slide to show you who the players are. So Henry Perkins was the director, Alan Anderson was the assistant field director, Harriet Abbott was a field worker, and there are numerous people um, that were on that first board um, that we, their names pop up all over the state uh, in various places. So Guy Bailey from the Bailey Howell Library, um, Dr. Stanley, Lena Ross, Charles Wilson, uh, Dr. Allen, Dr. Flint from Norwich, and doc, uh, Dr. Dalton, Professor Gilford, Gifford, and H.G. Ripley, and as I said, you, you'll find these names popping up throughout um, the state of Vermont. So in the next slide, um, I wanted to give you a few facts about the Vermont Eugenics Survey. So the Vermont Eugenics Survey was conducted under the auspices of the Department of Zoology at the University of Vermont. Henry Perkins was the director, and Ellen Anderson was the assistant director. Planned for, uh, they planned for a good eugenics program included routine mental and physical exams of school children with a registration of defects among other things. So I think Kathy will talk about that later. Um, but basically um, uh, there were two schools here in Burlington that they did mental exams on. Morrisville was one. Do you remember the third? I don't. I think it was Barnes, wasn't it? Yeah, in Burlington, but I think oh, there was a third oh. community. I don't remember what it was. But anyways, um, then the creation of a mental hygiene society whose object shall be the education of public opinion so that both public and private funds may be available for good eugenics and mental hygiene program. So I, the goal was for people to realize that hereditary, heredity is not the only factor in insanity. Such a, social society, such a society should be in a 
position to give aid to local communities who wish to inaugurate a eugenics program and providing colonies for the feeble-minded and sterilization law. And the reason I put that in there is because I wanted people to see where money was coming from. So money was coming from the, the private sector and also the public sector. Can I just say one point? So the children would, as they're, as it, when they were enrolled in the schools, they would be tested and at that moment, if they were determined to be feeble-minded, they would that would be their their classification from then onward. So they they were immediately labeled, and that would determine um, whether or not they would take pains to sort of you know help the communities rid themselves of these so-called feeble-minded children. And would one way be to put them in homes? What do you mean, so put them in homes? Take well, them away? We remove them from the family and put them in homes. No, actually, it was. Um, a series, they did a series of testing. There was a Dr. Metcalf at the university who um, went around to schools or had the children brought in. Who, they did um, mental testing. And um, sometimes um, the children um, were, were taken away from the parents to, to um, um, one of the many institutions throughout the state. Um, there was the uh, Brattleboro Institute, uh, I mean, uh, Brandon Institute, the Brattleboro Retreat, the, the Week School, all these various um, places where they would send children. There was also um, the Brandon waiting list. There was a huge waiting list for schools to get specific kids in. Um, sometimes they were placed in orphanages, um, places like St. Joseph's on North Avenue or Kern Hatton. In, in Putney. So sometimes they were placed in places like that and in order, they, they believe that um, breaking up the family um, history and continuity would help to create a, a more viable citizen. And they were approaching this from the scientific point of view. Correct. Yeah. This was pure science in their eyes. Yeah. And for the betterment of the Human society. De human development, right, yeah. right. Um, so in the next slide, um, I, I took um, the, the eugenics catechism from the National American Eugenics Society in 26. And so basically, they believed the most pre precious thing in the world was human germ plasm. And how- was, Excuse me? Human, human germ plasm. That's what they called the, the DNA, people's DNA, they called it at that time germplasm. Oh, okay. Um, and how may one's germplasm be immortal? Only, only by perpetuation, per, per, perpetuation of the children. So they believe that um, if, if you're going to save this really good germplasm, you're going to want your children to be good and and possess all the best genes, and then they will have children, and it will go through time. So their concern was identifying those as defective, delinquent, and dependent. And if you were deemed one of those three Ds, defective, dependent, and delinquent, then you did not have good germplasm. Okay? So um, what is a person's eugenical duty to civilization? And of course, that becomes to see that his own good qualities are passed on to the future generations, provided they exceed his bad qualities. If he has, on the whole, an excess of dysgenic qualities, they should be eliminated by letting the germ plaza die off with the individual. So then along comes the institutionalizing and the sterilizing to prevent these bad genes from being passed on. It has a great logic, doesn't it? Well, to yeah. some people, yeah. yeah. But it's not any different today, right? I mean, today we still we have Casper 9 and, and the uh, gene editing and the creating of lighter skin and lighter eyes. So it's within, it's within our view that it could possibly happen again. So they, when they were doing the, the um, sterilization, often without people's knowledge, so somebody could go to the hospital for, you know, um, appendic appendicitis, and they would come out sterilized and not even know that. Um, so they, the doctors, I guess, who participated, felt they were doing society um, a favor 
but people were really just you know becoming sterilized just without their their knowledge and so today we have um, women in prisons who are strongly encouraged and, and given incentives to, um, to be sterilized. Um, so it, there's, there's a lot of um, very broad overlap in those programs. And the other thing I think is, for me, was astounding is that these laws are still on the books today in Vermont. So they haven't taken the eugenics laws off the books. They've changed them. The wording has changed, but they're still on the books. This is astounding. Mm -hmm. This is uh, what you're describing is like a big brother on steroids back in the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And that still is, is going on today or aspects of this program are still going on. Well, um, these were the progressive people of the time and they believed this was pure science. And um, so the, not to say it's the same thinking with progressive people of today, but it certainly was back then. Those progressive people believed that this was pure science and science was gonna help them save their world. And that it was good, right? Mm -hmm. The good that all men aim at, right? right. Except so. it was subjective. It was good in the eyes of those that were in the progressive movement to move this type of thinking forward. Right. So the Vermont State in 1918 um, said that the greatest threat to society is a, uh, is a feeble-minded woman of childbearing age. That's in this book right here. I don't think you reached that, Judy, but so that, that's on the books and um, at, at, was at the time, I don't know if that's still on the books, but they really haven't changed. Um, I think it's the, the tan one there. Um, so that's just, this is the State of Vermont Board of Control, and so there's a, a lot of control involved, but, um, but really it, it, it says, um, I, I don't wanna look for it, but, but basically that a, a feeble-minded woman, and feeble-minded is, is you know, decided by someone, as Judy said, very subjectively, um, but it could have been with these tests in, in school. It, it, this also talks about testing children as soon as they enroll in schools. And um, so, yes, a woman of childbearing age who is deemed feeble-minded is the, the greatest threat to society. It's just, that's, that's the statement. No, <laughs> no qualifications. And it's astounding what little power the family had over their own children once they would send them to school. Right. When Nancy Gallagher and I first started um, researching the stories we had been hearing for years, um, people would tell us stories like, yeah, well, we went to visit my cousins last week and the whole family was gone. And we're like, what? We, we didn't get it because it didn't match up with, um, with the actual documentation the scientists had written. And then what we discovered was there was this social component. Well, this particular couple, couple was cohabitating, which was cohabitation was illegal to um, live together and not be married, um, had been determined they were co legal, illegally cohabitating, and so they were sent to institutions. Consequently, their children were sent to institutions. And so then someone going to visit the family would discover the family totally gone and not, to not understand why. So, oops, sorry, did you wanna say something? No. So the next slide is Vermont's way of thinking. And I put a couple quotes in here just to show how the leaders, the, 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 the progressive party was thinking. So um, Professor Flint, who was on the board and, uh, prof and a professor at Norwich, I, we, I found this statement from him. In other words, sterilization or segregation of the feeble-minded may gradually eliminate their kind. So that was the direction they were going in. And Rural Vermont, a program for the future, which um, later became the Vermont Commission on Country Life. Um, in 31, the Vermont Commission on Country Life presented its initial finding in a book entitled Rural Vermont, a program for the future. Eugenics discourse permeated the report. The committee researching the people advocated that it was the patriotic duty of every normal Vermont couple to have children in sufficient numbers, as well as to keep gen Gene genealogical records that would assist members of their ancestral stock when choosing appropriate mates. Now, this um, 
this committee is all the board of directors that I first mentioned when I had the players. They, they wrote the chapter on the people in, um, in the book Kathy has there, the oh, rural Vermont, which was the plan for moving forward for Vermont. And as you can see, um, they were concerned in keeping ancestral stock in place for certain, for, for normal Vermont couples. And who would be a normal Vermont couple? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Yankees, basically, so. Mm -hmm. They called them old Yankees. And when you read this, it's, it's pretty amazing. It sounds like they're talking about animal stock and breeding. That's ah. essentially okay. what. Yeah, they use that, that information mm. to, on humans, basically, to, if we, can, if we can make a better cow, why can't we make a better person? Right. They actually said and that. And they, they, they created pedigree charts, and they used the terminology that they would use on breeding better horses or cattle or sheep. So what, and what was their legal power then? Were they, were they state employees? No, they were, for, well, they were employees from institutions all over the state, so, but that, but Henry Perkins, the director, was a professor at UVM. Of zoology. And um, so the state is, was supporting it as were individual private people. So you, that's where you were talking about the money, where right. the money was coming from. Right, right. What did they say, follow the money? Yeah. Yeah. So on the next slide, so there was lots of problems with this kind of thinking about the fact that sterilizing or institutionalizing was the end all to be all to have a, a, um, a good gene move forward. So the determination of who was defective, delinquent, and dependent was subjective and most often based on someone's personal opinion. So if you and I were having a disagreement and we were in the same family, and Harriet Abbott came to visit you today, and you were like really upset with me, she might say all kinds of things that weren't true. And so that's where the personal opinion and the subjective material comes into play in determining who is defective, delinquent, and dependent. And this Har Harriet Abbott is the social worker, right? Yes, she worked for the um, Vermont Children's Aid Society and then moved from there to the Vermont Eugenics Survey. But it could also have been something like, like I have a hearing disability and, and hearing impairment, so I would, I would automatically be defective, and so I, just by that fact. So, so things that we now, you know, we have accommodations we can make for children or people. We have um, medical procedures. Um, we try to make, you know, life accessible to those who are blind, who have hearing impairments and so forth, who, are, who are, um, have another disability. And at that time, it was just uh, eliminate them because they could pass this on to the next generation. Right. And what about the test? Was it like an IQ test? And what about the language? Right. <laughs> I mean, because people would be like you are Franco-American mm -hmm. and, and bilingual speakers. And what about the children who would speak only their native language at home and be thrust into the school where they'd have to take this test? French well, Canadians are categorically they wanted to eliminate um, French Indians, French Canadian people, um, not just because of the language, because of their religion, because they had families in large numbers, which there's a, their own cultural reasons for that. So um, they were almost by definition um, targeted. Right. Well, that and, um, th and French were Catholics. And so the, the primary um, group that actively went against this was the Catholic Church. Um, and the, the supporters of this were the Protestants, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So again, you have religion in there as well as um, cultural groups, ethnicity. But wasn't it also true that it was voted on at some point right. by the people of Vermont, I think? The legislation. Oh, okay. So in 1925, um, it did, to sterilize <coughs> was not passed, but in 31 it was passed. The sterilization law, right? Which which was what? What what was the sterilization law? Um, basically, it said that um, you know if two doctors recommend this person is defective, dependent, and delinquent, and it's problematic, 
for this person to reproduce, we can sterilize them. And all power is taken out of the individual's hands right. and the family's hands. Which yeah. today is what happens, right, with, with uh, people deemed um, mentally ill, mentally retarded, can't. Um, people, if two people don't want them to reproduce, they can sign and that person's rights can be taken away. Yeah. And what two people in, in the laws today, would they have to be family members or would they be? Uh, I think, th I'm not really teachers. sure, I don't recall, but I think it was doctors as well. This is, this is frightening that, as you say, Kathy, it's still on the, uh, on the books. This yeah. law is still on the yeah. books yeah. with no push to get rid of it. Because it's not taught, to, so people don't know about it, and right. so it's, it was covered up, and it's still, you know, if you, if you bring it up to people who do know, they say, okay, well, you know, mistakes were made in the past, it's, yes, it's, it's a, a dark, you know, part of our history, but look, we've moved on now, and so, um, when in fact we haven't, and some of the effects are, are as simple as in my, I, my family, so my mother uh, was born in Winooski at, at home, and among her siblings and her cousins, of which there were many, there was a tremendous fear of doctors among some people, so they, they just wouldn't get medical help. And so I, I never understood that until, you know, I, I really became aware of the eugenics movement, and then it kind of made more sense. So they just would avoid going to see doctors. Right. And Kim, your, your background is from Quebec, right? Well, uh, yeah, so I'm, well, third or second generation, depending on what side of my mother's family, um, Franco-American. So my mother didn't speak English till she was nine, but she went to parochial school, so she, you know, uh, St. Francis School, the convent at the time, um, school was in, in French and in English. So they kind of were able to avoid the, the you know, pub public school labeling by going to a parochial school, even though they're very poor and had to pay. That's what most French families did. So to continue with the slides, um, so uh, informants, so not only was the information based on uh, personal opinion, but inf informants were selected to give the desired responses. Um, and in many cases, um, like in the, the um, case of my family, uh, no medical exams existed to determine the defect. So in my family, over many, many generations, um, 623 people were researched, and um, their, their supposed defect was Huntington's chorea, which is a um, disease that is hereditary, and, um, and people um, have problems in their, their 30s, 40s, 50s, and they're usually deceased by the time they're in their 70s and 80s and 90s. But all of the examples of people they said had it were already in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and there was no um, medical exams given to prove that they had it. And uh, nobody in the family has it today. And it's a hereditary disease. So it was very subjective. <coughs> Um, and when you're in your 70s, you have a natural decline of, of uh, walking gait and, and memory, perhaps, and which all is, these things. Which are yeah. similar symptoms, which yeah. is what the conclusion, because they were saying, you know, that he's, um, he has trouble getting up and down out of his chair, he has trouble with this, so then recalling this and that, so the normal progression was to say, yeah, that's what they had, Huntington's career. And what was the consequence? Um, institutionalization many times, yeah. Um, so then the next one is many times that cultural misunderstandings occurred due to language barriers, as Kim talked about. Um, they were expected to make out, um, do certain IQ tests or different kinds of tests, and they couldn't because they didn't speak English well. Um, and they didn't have to. There was whole communities of French-speaking people in which they had everything they needed from the cobbler to the banker, you know? So there was really no need to, to speak. Um, I've interviewed people who used to say, they would say things like, um, did, I would ask them, did you ever feel intimidated by the old Yankees? And they're like, hell no, there was too damn few of them. But then if you look at uh, Ellen Anderson's book, 
in we Americans, uh, the, the majority of people were f French or French Indian descent in this state. And um, as my father would say, you used to be able to walk down Church Street and only hear French spoken. And again, Ellen Anderson addresses um, that in her book about different stores and shops and stuff where um, people only spoke French. In Newski, until I, I interviewed people in the 80s, and there were many people who didn't have to speak English because they could get all their services, all their good, you know, needs and uh, goods and services met by by speaking in French. And so m most people were, you know, many people were bilingual in terms of, of French Canadians, um, but you just didn't really have to speak English because, as Judy said, the communities met all of their own needs. You know, we had our own schools, we had our own hospital, really, Fanny Allen. We had, um, and the nuns were, spoke French. We had um, even St. Mike's, you know, was really considered the, the French college of the time. So um, so they were sort of impervious, I would say, to, to this, which was even more frustrating and um, I think probably frightening to Yankees. So, like in my mom's family, there was um, an expression: if, if you only had two kids, it was called um, "a l'américain." So, in the in the fashion of Americans, because that was like weird to just have two kids, because the French families had so many children. So it, w it was a threat, I think. Mm -hmm. well, my husband had patients in the '90s when we m moved here that he had to speak French to. They spoke no English. So, it's you know, but those were older patients. But it, it really was people didn't speak English a lot. Yeah, and in your narrative, you're saying that according to the eugenics people, speaking only French was considered a, a defect, almost a genetic defect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's in some cases it yeah. was, yeah, yeah. Would you talk more about the social worker, Ms. Anderson, mm -hmm. who, uh, she was on the uh, committee, on the eugenics committee? She was assistant director. Yes, um, and so uh, she was going for a PhD and she wrote, um, um, we Americans, the, let's see, we Americans, the study of cleavage in an American city. Mm -hmm. And basically she's talking about the distinct difference of, um, of all these other cultural groups, German and um, Italian. Italian and Lebanese and Jews, Jews, Jews. and um, all these different ethnic groups and how um, quickly they progress and how they get along with society. But the French have a little bit different way of doing that. And so the, Cleve the Irish was one of those groups too. And so she basically compares the, the French with all these other groups and the problems that um, Burlington experience. And when you drive down Archibald Street, you can see that in their cemetery. So all of those uh, uh, Irish are on one side and the French are on the other side. And occasionally on the French side, you'll see an Irish name or on the Irish name, you'll see a French name. And basically it's who lived longer in a mixed marriage to um, decide which side they were going to be buried on. So. <laughs> There's some really funny um, situations to to track down that story, and it's been recorded in 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 this book and many other places that we've read that that um, that that they tried not to encourage these mixed marriages with the French um, because it could be problematic is the way they feel, and it's a power story too, of course. Then right. The people on the eugenics survey had the power, right? And it, it's an astounding power now that we see your your study here, right? And it's uh, it's directly connected with what was happening in Quebec. So in Quebec, there were um, their population was decreasing, and so they in 1890 they passed a law, the law of 12 children, and encouraged these families to have um, many children at least 12, because <laughs> 12 would give you the opportunity to have 100 acres of land. It was an old law that was um, put into place um, during the time of Louis XIV um, when the French had come over because they were trying to basically um, populate the province of, of Quebec and as much of Canada. That was like La Nouvelle France, it was New France at the time. So, um, so um, when the law was 
brought back up again in the 1890s. Um, so many people had left um, Quebec or, or, yeah, I guess French Canada to work in the mills because they had, um, you know, after the conquest, the English got all the good land. So the, the French were encouraged by the priests and by the, you know, the elite of Quebec uh, government and, and society to have as many children as possible on very poor land. So, um, so my, my family, when my great grandmother would say, my great grandfather would say, well, when we go back to Canada, and my great grandmother would say, in Canada, your children were starving. So working in the mills was better than trying to farm on poor land. So especially when you're being told constantly to have all these children. So after the, they, they stopped giving out land, they started giving them money to have 12, 12 living children. They had to be surviving children, so baptized. And so um, that was directly competing with the, the eugenics, you know, um, movement. And so they kind of got us coming and going. And, and uh, so it was a, caught between a rock and a hard place. Right. So in 1894, um, they changed the law. Um, instead of giving 100 acres, they said, we'll give you $100. And that $100 um, back then was uh, like equivalent to 10000 so they had their own little tribe of people. They had 12 people or more. Um, in some cases, um, we've read about 36 children. And so they moved them here to work in the mills. So in, in 95, 96, 97, in Burlington, Winooski, and Colchester, there was an explosion of mills to um, make, use these people for, for cheap labor. And, um, and so consequently, these these people went off to also have large families, which brings us into that 20s and 30s range, 1920s and 1930s, where they were becoming overwhelmed by the population of Francos living here. So and they thought it was a threat then? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. They were very fearful of the numbers. And the propaganda was um, in asking, remember, save your gene pro uh, plasm and and uh, keep track of your genealogy, have um, larger families, and, and it was fear. It was fear that was running everything. So I'd like to move on a little bit here um, to show you in the next slide um, some of the, so the Vermont Eugenics Survey was just that. It was a survey. And there were many, many surveys. I've lifted, listed some of them here. Um, the Migra study, the key family, the fitter families, the ethnic study, the mental survey of school children, which was done here in Burlington. If you could see that slide on, um, do you want to have that, have him, Alex show the slide? Just so people can see the list. Yeah, we'll get, no, we'll get to oh, it, because okay. I don't want to get off track. The pedigree studies, the Brand, Brandon wedding list, the Rutland reform study, but also the rural sur survey study, the Vermont Commission on Country Life. And this one is the important one because this one had uh, two, uh, 11 different uh, committees of which two Dorothy Kipfield Fisher belonged to. She was on the education committee, a subcommittee called adult education. And she was on the Vermont, um, uh, the study for traditions and ideals. And so there, one of the things we always hear is there's no direct connection with her and eugenics. But there really is, not only in the speak, the eugenical speak in her books, but directly um, serving on that committee. And in the third annual meeting, the next slide, um, the third annual meeting of the advisory committee of the Eugenic Survey of Vermont um, in October 18, 1928, uh, that they launched a comp comprehensive rural survey, but um, they deferred the further study of the better branches in order to take an active part of the comprehensive survey. And the funded was, was granted and budgets were created by the Vermont Eugenics Survey to support the rural su study. So this study that Dorothy Campbell Fisher um, was a part of, the Vermont Eugenics Survey suspended everything else so the entire staff and all of their money could focus on that study. Um, and so where, how does she fit into this? So she fit into this because um, she was a member of the committees, um, both of them, the education and the Vermont traditions. She was voted to be the chair of the, of the Traditions and Ideals Committee, but she refused because of her health. And she wrote propaganda literature. So 
th as this was started in 1928, the book wasn't published till 31, but as it was started, um, these different committees were communicating back and forth, and they were starting to um, request um, propaganda to promote their work be created. So Dorothy Campbell Fisher was asked to write a play, which she did called Tourist Accommodated. Um, and she was also asked to write for the Tourist Committee um, uh, brochures, public brochures, um, to attract certain types of tourists to the state. She wanted those who um, were professionally trained to use their brains for a living to apply to purchase a second home. And uh, she uh, asked that manufacturing and um, people who bargained for a living not uh, um, uh, buy a second home here because they would not find common ground among the people who lived here. So she wanted doctors and lawyers, um, teachers, professors, and she had a very, you know, select group. And, and she, they, you know, actually she refers to them by by their, you know, professions. And, and actually says, you know, as Judy said, others need not apply. So, you know, just <laughs> stay away, basically. So the, the others are not uh, spoken, but they could be Jews or, right. or any or, other people. We're yeah. not Christian Protestants. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But also those in manufacturing, as we just told you, were the French Canadians who were working at the mills, right? Yes. yes. Right. And... Um, so anyways, um, let's get to the more of um, focus on her. Right. So, um, so she wrote <coughs> this propaganda literature, and here's one example. And um, she assisted in gathering the materials to create the Green Mountain series, which were four books, of which I have three. I haven't been able to find my copy of the fourth one. but. Um, so the tradition and ideal wanted them to collect the written words, the written poetry, the short stories, the ballads, the songs, all of these things that, that um, denoted the history of Vermont. And they felt it was important to collect this stuff and save it. But what they collected was everything of British Isles. There, of, in all four books, there is nothing Abenaki and nothing Frank, Franco-American. Um, there, there is um, a song of the death of the Alnabak, death of the Indian, and uh, that was written for one of the very first plays this state had, uh, this country had, but it was written that they're dead and gone. And uh, there was one of Roland Robinson's stories um, where he um, writes about, in broken English, his version of the French and French Indian people in the state through Uncle Elijah's cabin and all that series. Mm -hmm. And so there were... Which writer is that, Judy? Roland Robinson. Okay. So okay. there's interpretations by other people. So he, the caricatures basically, he, he's not part of the culture. He's writing the one or two stories about French Indians, I think only one, right? And it's a caricature of them. So he's, he's writing in how he interprets their dialect to sound to him. So. Um, the same thing was done with, with African Americans, you know, there's a lot of literature that, you know, Uncle Remus kind of thing, you know, that only for French, French Indians. So that was the example in these books they gave for our people, but then at the same time, we know there were a lot of Francos, um, Betis, um, uh, Daniel Tremblay, for example, had written numerous books um, of, of story and poetry um, between 1915 and 1942. And, but none of his um, stuff shows up in this. And of course, there were many, many songs and many other things. The poem but that we recited earlier was from, was from that body of, of literature. Work. Okay. Right. Do you want to re recite a little bit of that? Oh, the wind she, she blow on Lake Champlain, Champlain from by she, she blow some, some more. more. You'll never get drowned on Lake Champlain if you never go off the, the shore. shore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyways. Then um, she wrote introductions and contributions to the WPA Writers Project, which is this one, in which um, uh, she has a, a very narrow perspective. It was, it was the the it was um, written to to put the people to work, 
uh, who were writers and poems, uh, poets during the time of the Depression. And uh, it was a guidebook. It was written as a guidebook to travel throughout um, Vermont and learn about the history of Vermont. But the perspective, again, is from white Anglo Protestants. And this, um, is, this is an example, right, of the one of them, isn't this? Yeah. So um, at least a dozen persons have gone over the falls and lived, the first of whom there is any record was an Abeniki squaw whose adventure was celebrated in print as early as 1781, which I tried to find weeks and weeks of research all in that Bellows Falls area, tried to find the story and was not able to. Carelessly allowing her canoe to be drawn to the point where she could not paddle against the current, the squaw drank a bottle of rum that she was taking to her brave and lay down in her canoe and weighed her fate. She was fin fished out below the falls, quite safe and quite drunk. The, and so that, I mean, those are the kinds of stories she draws people into as they tour Vermont. Um, and then uh, she wrote magazine articles to promote the Vermont Eugenics Sur Survey, including Ross's Girls, a promotional story of the Rutland Reformatory study, which was one of the studies we showed earlier. And in, in it, she gives this like glowing report about how reforming these um, French girls, these Franco-Americans and others is, is such a great thing and look at the accomplishments they can make and, and um, but has no clear um, story of what their lives were before. So she's just making the assumption their lives are better now. Mm. Um, she, uh, let's see, and her, her public writing tells one story and her personal writing tells an, another story. And I'll show you what I mean on the, on the next slide. So the next couple slides. So in reply to her correspondence observation, the most immigrants were poor and ignorant. Fisher asserted that while it was easier to befriend, befriend educational foreigners, white, um, white native-born Americans should also make a special effort not to look down on the WAPs and Dagos. Dagos. In response to a request from Burgess... Whose language was that? Dorothy, Dorothy Campbell, Campbell Fisher. Fisher's. That was her language? Yes. Using those... those div derisive terms for yes and the problem is people say those were the words of the time to us but they weren't the words of the time for everybody they clearly were the words of the time for that progressive movement but not for a lot of the people we knew do you want to show that slide or not we'll get we're gonna i want to get through this through here in response to a request from Burgess Johnson about Miss Lucille Miller of Bethel, an avowed communist, Dorothy Campbell Fisher said, not an interesting or agreeable subject to write about, a person crippled in body and apparently also in mind and personality. So her personal letters, uh, the whole point of this is to show you um, that she's writing one thing personally, but in her books, she's like, more sly about how she tells that story. Um, in correspondence with Burgess Johnson concerning the financial situation of Marlborough College, Dorothy Canfield Fisher states, people of considerable means are often so smarting under the idea that they are obliged by law to help support the government. It was formerly not too hard to enlist the sympathy and financial help of liberal-minded rich people. That source of financial support has pretty well dried up. So she, um, this college was started, was funded by people who were going that were on the GI Bill and she was encouraging people not to donate to help them and consequently um, fail. And so I want to get to s some of the, the um, other um, eugenics type speak that she uses. So in the next slide, only particular people were worthy of purchasing a vacation home in Vermont. Dorothy Canfield Fisher reached out with a special invitation in the Vermont propaganda brochure. 
according to the Vermont Tourist Brochure, newcomers needed to establish tap roots in, in stable communities, but only if they already possess character cultivation and good breeding. Dorothy Canfield Fisher identified professors, doctors, and lawyers, and others who earned their living by professionally trained use of their brains. The, the, those excluded from her special invitation were those who dealt with manufacturing, buying, selling material objects, or handling money, as well as people accustomed to bargaining. Dorothy Canfield Fisher reiterated these words and urged state officials to develop a traveling exhibit with the right kind of person in charge, designed to convince discriminating people who resembled their best Vermonters. Educational achievements, not financial status, was the distinguishing quality that Dorothy Canfield Fisher wanted to attract to the state. In a speech before the State Chamber of Commerce, Fisher suggested that it use college mailing list to disseminate literature about Vermont summer homes and that it tour an exhibit to Vermont campuses to track the best prospects for a special invitation, which is what we talked about earlier she, in this Vermont publication, which it was put out by Vermont Bureau of Publicity, the Office of Sec Secretary of State. Those words all came from here. It was a great cultivation of an elite. Exactly, and which is pro predominant in most of her books. The elitism and um, racism, is it just permeates her books. And you're not talking about one particular phase, like that is one of the arguments that you, ha you all have received that, well, Dorothy Canfield Fisher did, was interested, <laughs> just interested in the mm -hmm. eugenics movement, and that was only for a short period of time in her life. Yes, she went right up through. Um, she she did it at a certain point. Um, she became aware, I think, that she she had been a little what we would say is tone deaf, and she had, you know, she tried to kind of um, change her tone when she was uh, in certain instances, you know, to present to the public. Um, so depending on what her audience was, but in her personal correspondence, she takes off the gloves and she really, you know gets right down to using the same kind of language she had and, and that was consistent throughout her life so so she really did not change at all and it, and it's you know if you if you read her work as the sort of the butt of the joke you know if you, if you were the, to read and say oh I'm the person that she is discouraging from coming to the state or she would have liked to get rid of right. then you see a totally different work than if you're just you know looking at it superficially right so for example um, what Kim's talking about, in 1953, she published a book called Vermont Traditions, and in there, she tries to correct a lot of her wrongs, but she still says things like, um, um, we need to do something about the French Canadians in this town, or they're going to vote us out of our town. And so, um, I know we're like running short of time, so I just want to tell you too that there's a bunch of historians um, that have written about her, and there's one in particular. So Kevin Dan um, in Degeneration to Regeneration, he writes about her, and Nancy Gallagher writes about her in Breeding Better Vermonters, and Writers of Conviction, um, she also writes about her, but then when you get to um, the book, um, that the books that are being republished, um, Mark Madigan is editing them, he's putting in timelines, and um, he's putting in um, um, editorial comments. Um, he denies that, um, that these people who have written about her and makes the connection with eugenics. He says, it's not true. Kevin Dan is mistaken when he associates Fisher with the eugenic genesis through her participation in the Vermont Commission on Country Life. Um, Kevin Dan was not incorrect. As I showed earlier, the Vermont Commission on Country Life was funded and totally supported by the entire staff and the entire board wrote the, the chapter on the people in that book. There's direct connection, and her words come through all the way into her books in the 40s and 50s. She's still using the same words. This is after it's been, eugenics has been discredited as a pseudoscience, so 
the rest of the world is sort of like catching on and she's still kind of right, right there. Right. So um, we have received comments in the form of letters, many letters, um, um, during this whole process. And I'd like to s s use our last words to talk about these comments and, and anything else Kathy might want to add. Um, but so um, Helene Lang t has told us several times she's a Vermonter for the world. And, and uh, the way our way of thinking is we don't want a eugenicist representing Vermont. And Phil Baruth, he's um, sent several letters as well. I do work with Dorothy Canfield Fisher in my class. I don't think I am the one to help you in this quest. Fisher was prolific and a best-selling woman of the period, and she was routinely denigrated by male reviewers who wanted to point out that her work shouldn't sell so many copies, and I wouldn't myself want to join the ranks and wipe her out and, na and na wipe her work and name out in the historical record. Sorry, I can't be of any help. And basically what he's saying um, to me when he wrote to me is, yeah, um, I don't want to be in the same place as her. But he's forgetting that those people that were complaining were people who didn't believe in that progressive movement of eugenics. And, um, and then again, we were told things like, yeah, Dorothy Canfield didn't know Henry Perkins, or she was just naive. She didn't really know what he was doing. Um, and then Dorothy Canfield Fisher was an important historical figure who was ahead of her time. Well, maybe because we're still talking eugenics today. <laughs> so she could, <laughs> she could have been. No. Um, Dorothy Canfield Fisher was, uh, let's see, and so then we start seeing colonial tactics of divide and conquer and personal attacks. And so Judy Dow is uh, not a Beneke. Judy Dow is just a basket maker. She doesn't have the skills to do research. She's just a basket maker. She belongs in a category of activists with little to no indigenous heritage. This is an extremely na naive way to read fiction at best. At worst, it is dishonest. It's a breach of professional standards. I don't, I don't see her work, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, as irreparably tainted by what connects. Um, connections exist to those other, uh, those other social currents. But I've yet to read Bombfire, which is the main book we've been talking about as having a, where she took the characters in that book directly from the Vermont eugenics records and carried them through into several other um, books as we moved on. That, that's totally shocking. It is. So in, in the way it, she was living in Arlington, right? Yes. And this was the survey that was conducted right around there. Correct. The town next door is Sandgate. And um, in the Sandgate report, there are several um, pages of town rumors. and. And even the, the town, the, the landscape of the town became identical in the book Bonfire. The town rumor stories, um, the old settler stories, all got implemented into Bonfire and carried through into Season Timber and Rough Hewn. And these are the caricatures again. So for example, there's, a, there's one character, um, Lix Lee, who's a French, probably French Indian woman, who is, is supposed to be, you know, um, She's, you know, kind of slovenly, and she is um, promiscuous and, and sort of like, um, you know, just portrayed in such a way that it's a caricature, and, and those are taken directly. The, these, I, I call them caricatures, even in Dorothy Canfield Fisher's works, because they're not fully developed characters. They're just kind of a representative, but the, she takes the exact language out of the Sandgate Report and, and doesn't even bother to, to really to disguise them at all, so it's, it's very transparent. And so the unfortunate thing about that is people can recognize their families in her books from that town and from those reports. And um, so, in, but the problem is a lot of these people who've been um, critical have been reading for years and years and years her work, not the eugenics records work. And so they don't recognize in her work the eugenics speak that's there. They don't recognize those connections. And um, 
Kathy, you haven't said anything about education. The other committee that she worked on was um, education, the Educational Committee. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, I just, I mean, I found that there were direct quotes in here of what they were asking the schools to do. And that I found very disturbing because, as you have said before, they were asking them to collect the names of these children that were defected, deficient, and, you know. So I just, I mean, the other thing I found interesting in the education part of this is that many of the same problems. So these were people that were very progressive in, in, in their political thought, and how eugenics comes in there without them actually criticizing it at all. I, you know, the other thing that I think that we haven't touched on at all is that, that at this time was where the fascist movement in Germany was beginning, and there were scientists of Hitler's that were having correspondence with American eugenicists about how they got the population to go along with this. And not that the eugenics movement here was, fast, was you know, a Nazi movement. I don't want to say that, nor vice versa. I just want, I think it's very important that we understand the connection there and, and that those, those laws are still on the books and that we as a people of Vermont need to stay alert and very critical of what's going on so that those things never happen. I think that, you know, when you look at what went on, we're in the Holocaust month where so many people talk about the Holocaust. I think this is our Holocaust and we need, it's not the same thing, but it, we need to be very vigilant about what's going on. Kathy lived in Germany for how many years? For 13 years. She's yeah. also been a school board member in Burlington for, I, I forget how many years. Oh, well, I was for four years back in the 90s, but I just, I'm on the board again, so I'm presently. So one of the things we had as um, in a discussion on the way here today was um, we're not even sure if Common Core um, addresses teaching in our schools about eugenics. However, in 1972, when I went to Burlington High School and the required history reading was Ellen Anderson's book on We America. And so I had to read this in 1972, but we go to school after school and they don't even know what it is today. So um, we've all found that very discerning. Even some librarians didn't know about the eugenics right. movement. They just haven't, they were shocked, you know. Right. And it's just, uh, the question is for, for, is why do Vermonters continue to accept Dorothy Canfield Fisher as a role model for children despite her history of belief in eugenics? Now that, that's, that's you've been answering that question throughout this because you, uh, you bring up the comments from renowned uh, professors and an elite, sorry, this an elite privileged world that is speaking against you. Right. And you're reaching today, I believe, also the, the ordinary viewer like myself and the person who wants to learn about this and doesn't know about it at all. And all of this is so shocking. And the question, I still have that question, to the elite, to the privileged people today, even, even to the, the school board who's, uh, not the school board, but the Vermont Board of uh, Libraries who discuss this, why are you sweeping this under the rug? This is hidden history. Okay. And you women have come forth with this today and I'm right. very grateful. And it's not, it's not wrong to tell, you know, people say it's revisionist, but it's not. Just because it took 100 years for Frinkles or French Indian people to tell this side of the story doesn't mean it's not true. You know, you have your opinion, I have my opinion, and um, it's, it's what we don't own is the facts. And if I present the facts, then that should not be deemed as not being history. Facts are facts. And, um, 
And so basically on this slide, one of my final slides, is um, the essence of, race, of racism is denial and inaction. And so it's all these comments like, I don't see color, I don't see, um, you know, I'm not racist. It's that denial of not even acknowledging it that, and then that, that means you can't do anything. You can't, there's no action done because people are still denying it. And then if you go back to the previous slide I had, the, um, to quiet the voices of those that are oppressed results in historical trauma. This trauma is passed on from generation to generation with no chance of healing for the children and grandchildren of the future. So if we don't acknowledge it, if we continue to deny, there is no healing. And people are still in this box of, of pain. And so it's time for discussion. It's time for truth telling. And um, so we have, like you said, been strong enough to stand up and tell the truth and present the facts. And because of that, we get the colonial tactics of divide and conquer and personal attacks. But here you are. You're speaking today, all of you. And uh, this is the beginning for, for Channel 17, too. And we invite you back to continue this discussion, this important discussion, and our, our search for some kind of, for the enlightenment that will lift us to another level where we're, we're down to a low level now. Well, I think education is critical and we're all educators, so we've got to do our best to keep educating. And I'm not going to say um, it's going to um, repeat itself if we don't, because it's already repeating itself. And so people have just got to see it. They've got to educate themselves enough to see it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Thank Kathy, you Kim, and, and Judy. Thank you. And, and viewers, we, we have, we've learned a lot, and we can go forward with this enlightenment. Thank you for, for watching. Goodbye for now.